pray. Amen. Okay, I'll excuse the young people to head next door. And with that, let's open our Bibles. I'm going to have you open your Bible to Exodus 4. I know we're way past that in our reading. Uh, we're way past that in our small group uh, times, but we're going to look at a section in Exodus 4 uh, this morning. Uh, one of the things that we get to do when we go through a book in its entirety a lot of times is cover passages that we might not ordinarily cover. Um, there are passages, I think, that, uh, 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 you know, uh, we, just, we just might not cover. We're going to be covering a little bit of an unusual passage in Exodus 4 today. Uh, one of the passages that probably when you read through it, you're kind of like, huh? Um, uh, what's, what's going on there? And uh, so we'll try to look at it, and I'll try not to uh, uh, superimpose my ideas on the text, try to understand what the text is really talking about. With that, I want to say it'll take us a couple of minutes to get to Exodus 4. I want us to have a little background into the life of Moses because the section we're looking at, I really believe, gives us an insight into God's work in the man of God as he prepares the man of God to walk in the work of God. Moses gets a very clear call in chapter 3 but as we read about Moses and his response to the call, his immediate response is, God, I think you've got the wrong guy. I know, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I think you've got the wrong, I think you've got the wrong guy. I'm, I'm not the man for the job. And so I want us to, in some ways, look at Moses and see what God does in him in order to prepare him then for the work that he does. You know, when you think about Moses and the book of Exodus, well, I'll, I'm going to date myself now. When I think of Moses, what actor do you think of when you think of Moses? <laughs> Charlton Heston, right? Okay. You, you, everybody thinks of, not everybody, but at least people who are a little older think of Charlton Heston. Um, we're thinking about, you know, this, uh, like, magnificent... Uh, <clears throat> He was also in Planet of the Apes, so it kind of, you know, there's, <laughs> right? That's him, right? <laughs> yes. Um, we're thinking of this actor, and I'm like, I think of this, like, champion of a man. Um, but when we get introduced to Moses in Exodus 3 and Exodus 4, that's really not where he is. Um, and what we watch, in some ways, is God's, rebuilding of the man. God's taking the man of God and preparing him for the work he's called to. It's really a story of God restoring something that was seemingly lost. So it'll take us a few minutes to get to Exodus 4. Um, I promise I won't keep you here all day. Um, I'll keep an eye on the clock. Um, and uh, But I think, I think, I think God's going to speak to us today because I think God wants to do works of restoration in all of us, that that's part of what he does. He doesn't just use us, he values us, he cherishes us, and he actually works in us in a way that we can then walk out his eternal kingdom plan. Father, I come before you and I thank you for the work that you do in the lives of men and women. Uh, an amazing work of restoration. Father, as we look into the life of Moses here, in this section before, before the 10 plagues, before he stands before Pharaoh, before he leads the people out of Egypt and through the Red Sea, before he brings them to the wilderness, before there's water from a rock, before there's manna from heaven, before there's quail, before there's a, a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day, before there's ten commandments on Sinai, uh, before there's all that, Lord, there's a man 
who has an encounter with you, a man who's very, very broken. Uh, Lord, I pray today <clears throat> that you'd, uh, uh, you'd not only help us to see your work in, in the man, but you'd, you'd encourage our hearts uh, for the work you want to do in us. And so, Father, I pray for, for you to minister here today. Amen. Let's go to uh, Acts chapter 7. Turn in the New Testament. You can keep your finger in Acts chapter, uh, Exodus chapter 4. I've got a little red, red ribbon uh, in my Bible. And so you can put, put your ribbon, your Bible ribbon, or a, uh, just a piece of paper in Exodus chapter 4 because we'll end up back there. But I want you to look at Acts chapter 7 for a moment. Beginning in uh, verse 17, Stephen, um, one of the early apostles, um, uh, before he's martyred at the end of this chapter, he is speaking to the descendants of Abraham, and he shares uh, lessons of faith through the ages. Um, and in particular, he talks a little bit about the story of Moses. I mentioned last week that some of the chronology of Moses' life is actually given to us here in Acts chapter 17. Um, if you look at uh, uh, verse, verse 21, but when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son, talking about Moses being drawn from the Nile. And, and Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now when he was 40 years old, that's how we know how old he was uh, when he killed the Egyptian, now, when, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. In other words, he had been raised in Pharaoh's courts, but he wanted to survey uh, the state of his brethren. He identified with the Hebrew people. Um, and so he came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. Verse 25, that's a big verse. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. Moses was misunderstood. Moses was like, what are you doing? He's following the will of God, and the people of God don't get it. it says verse 26 and the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them saying men and brethren why do you wrong one another because the next day there's Israelites fighting the first day it was an Egyptian who was abusing uh, uh, just beating a, 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 a Hebrew and uh, he killed the Egyptians for so the next day he gets in the middle of a quarrel between two uh, Hebrew uh, uh, men uh, but verse 27 says, but he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? He's rejected. He's just doing the will of God. Moses is identifying with the people of God in spite of the riches of Egypt. He identifies with the people of God. He, he, he's thinking everybody should know. I'm called to deliver. And yet he's misunderstood. Go ahead and now turn to... Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews 11, we get more insights into the life of Moses. Verse 23, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child. And they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. In spite of being born with a silver spoon in his mouth, he says, no, I'm, I'm one of the descendants of Abraham. He knew his identity, and he identified with the people of God rather than than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. This is good stuff. This is inspiring. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. I'm sharing all this to say that by the time Moses was 40, he had faith values in his heart. 
He is basically saying, I see the pleasures of sin, but it's nothing compared to the riches that we have as we follow God. And so he forsakes the pleasures of sin, and he's ready to follow God with the people of God. With that, we then go back to Acts 7, where he kills the Egyptian, um, and he's rejected. It doesn't go well. He then has to flee Egypt, basically as an escaped murderer. He gets then to the land of Midian. In what state does he arrive in Midian? And that's kind of where I'm going this morning as I kind of been thinking about Exodus 3 and Exodus 4. Does he go to Midian, the land of the Midianites, basically with this sense of, I'll say, um, bravado, that I'm the, uh, you know, I'm the prince of Egypt, I'm going to deliver the people of God, just didn't go the way I wanted, but we hit the pause button, but it's going to happen. I'm not sure that's where he's at. I'm not sure that's where he's at. In other words, what we find is he then has two sons. You'd think, oh, Moses was, by the, just the providence of God, raised in his own home, even though you know, Pharaoh's daughter had adopted him, but he gets to be raised in his own home. He's raised with Hebrew values. You would think now when he's a dad in Midian, how's he going to raise his kids? You know what? We're in the land of Midian, but we are Hebrew children. We're proud Hebrew children. We're the sons of Abraham. We're the descendants of Abraham. Uh, what does that mean, Dad? Is he doing that? It turns out it doesn't seem like he does that. Because one of the significant things that was a mark of the covenant with Abraham among the Hebrew children was that the sons were circumcised. The sons were circumcised. Moses gets to Midian, the land of Midian, marries, marries the daughter of Jethro, a priest of Midian, has two sons, and guess what? They're not circumcised. There's no sense of Moses raising his sons with the same sense of values that he was raised with. I'm not saying, it, I'm not, you know, I'm, I don't know exactly, you know, when, when we get to heaven after about a you know, gazillion years of worshiping Jesus, we can go talk to Moses and tell me the whole story, you know. Uh, uh, but he doesn't circumcise his sons. I think that is significant. I think it's significant. Because you would expect Moses to do that. The one who was, even though he was raised, adopted into Egypt, he was raised with an identity that he was a son of Abraham, a child of Abraham. Will he raise his own sons that way? He doesn't have them circumcised. So we get to this unusual passage that we'll look at in a moment in, uh, in the book of Exodus, where God confronts Moses about this issue. And one of those passages that I think a lot of commentators are like, what's, what's going on there? Maybe that came up in the small groups the last week or two. I don't know. Um, perhaps it, it did. Okay, yeah. Um, it's an interesting passage. So I'm, I'm saying this to say, if I think about then Moses' response to God in Exodus 3, it's starting to make sense. We have a man who at age 40 raised in Pharaoh's courts, but with a clear sense of an identity with the people of God. He gets to age 40. He identifies with the people of God. He understands he's called to be a deliverer. He has a prophetic sense that he's called to be a deliverer, and yet things go poorly for him. He flees to the land of Midian. He's, in a, he's a fugitive. He's there for 40 years. 40 years, and he's a shepherd taking care of his father-in-law's flocks. He has a family. God comes along and says to him, I'm going to use you. 
I'm going to use you. I've heard the cry of my people, and I want to send you. And we would all expect Moses to say, <laughs> reporting for duty. And he doesn't. He says, who am I? I it's as if Moses dropped the prophetic dream a long time ago. No, I, you, got, you got the wrong guy. Can you imagine what 40 years taking care of sheep is like when you were raised with a prophetic vision over your life and you, it's in there and everything goes south and the people you're going to deliver reject you they don't see the call on you you end up becoming a fugitive you got 40 years is a long time for anybody doing anything but taking care of sheep you know that's that's about as exciting as watching paint dry I mean you got you got a lot of think time when you're when you're taking care of sheep and I've watched I've watched shepherds at times and I'm like well that's just wow I, I I'm not the fastest paced guy but I don't know if I could do that very long I'm like and it's just day after day just a lot of time to think and what's going through your mind I blew it I blew it I blew it it's very possible Moses arrived in the land of Midian, told the whole story, shared all the details. Um, it's possible, you know, what do people do when they're fugitives? Sometimes they don't even tell the whole story. You know, just decided I would, I needed a change of pace. I don't know, we'll find out maybe. You talk to you know, Moses in detail sometime. But the idea is, God speaks to him and says, I'm going to use you. And Moses says, who am I that you would use me? And God says, and we covered this last week, God says, I will be with you. I will be your sufficiency. If you've learned anything, Moses, in the last 40 years, the thing you will have learned is you're not sufficient in yourself. You're going to learn that I'm your sufficiency. Moses then says, but... Okay, but what if they don't listen? I'm saying that because, again, we don't have this sense of a bravado, a, a sense of I'm the man of God, you know, God's man for the hour, and yes, that's not what's, what's being portrayed in Exodus chapter 3. We have a man who is very much, seems to be very broken, very, very much... Um, Lacking. God says, see the rod in your hand, throw it down, becomes a serpent. Wow. God says, pick it up by the tail, picks it up, becomes a rod again. If anybody doesn't listen, do that. Oh, oh by the way, see your hand, stick it in your garment, pull it out. Ah, leprosy. Put it back. It's fine. God says, do that. Be sure to do that for people. Moses' response by then should be, all right, this, this is for real. You know what he says? Uh, I, I'm not much of a public speaker. I, I think you got the, he's still saying, I think you've got the wrong guy. Still think you've got the wrong guy. Um, God says, your brother Aaron, Brother Aaron, he'll, he'll be the spokesman. Um, he'll be like a voice to you, and you'll be like God's voice to him. God will speak to Moses. Moses will tell Aaron. Aaron will then tell the people. And again, the, the picture that emerges in Exodus chapter 3 and then heading into chapter 4 is of a man who's very, very much broken, which helps us then understand, perhaps, what goes on in the next section. So I want to read now the text. We're finally there. Exodus chapter 4, starting in verse 18.
Exodus 4.18, so Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please let me go and return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see whether they are still alive. Um, this is following Moses' encounter with God at the burning bush, God speaking to him and saying, I'll be with you, God showing him the uh, the. The, the staff turning into a serpent, the hand becoming leprous, God saying, I'll provide Aaron as a spokesman for you. Finally, Moses, hallelujah, says, okay, I'll do it. Or as Moses, Moses, in a sense, is ready to put feet to the faith that's in him. So Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please let me go and return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see whether they're still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. Now the Lord said to Moses and Midian, go return to Egypt, for all the men who sought your life are dead. Then Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on a donkey, and he returned to the land in Egypt, land of Egypt, and Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do all these, those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand. Uh, the, the staff, the leprosy, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. That's important. That's like an important word because Moses, I don't want you to, I don't want you to be dismayed. Uh, if he doesn't let the people go right away, it's, it's, that's part of my plan. So don't be shocked by that. Verse 22, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Now verse 22 and 23 are important preaching. God's preaching to Moses. Israel is my son, my firstborn, so I will say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. The son issue is very, very important because in some ways, it was through the sons that the sign of the covenant of Abraham was passed on. And so God is basically saying, okay, sonship, 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 sonship. And Moses, I think, is supposed to get the, like, connect the dots. You've got sons. Are they sons of the covenant? Verse 24, let's go there. And it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. By the way, that phrase... Um, it, it comes to us, it, it, it's an interesting phrase, God sought to kill him. God doesn't, he doesn't have to attempt anything. <laughs> I mean, if he wants to kill you, you're done. Um, there's something going on here that commentators are not sure exactly what's happening. Most commentators probably conclude that Moses was probably experiencing some kind of severe sickness, some, some kind of severe illness, um, and he was... He was very, very sick. Um, so it says here, the Lord met him, sought to kill him. Then Zipporah, his wife, took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. Then she said, you are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. So the simple, simple thing is this. It seems like God's seeking to kill Moses. Zipporah, the wife, takes a knife made of flint. She circumcises the son. Uh, after the operation, she takes the foreskin, the flap of skin, and she puts it at the feet of Moses, uh, calls him a, a husband of blood, a bridegroom of, bridegroom of blood, referring to the circumcision. And at that point, the Lord lets him alone. Um, and uh, so he let him go, verse 26. Uh, the Lord, Lord lets him go. So what's happening here is we're seeing that Moses hasn't circumcised his sons. Don't know exactly why. Again, we can ask Moses at some point. As I think about my own humanity, um, I could very easily imagine leaving Egypt as a fugitive, getting to Midian. I could, I could imagine arriving very demoralized, very discouraged. I could imagine feeling let down by the people of God. I could imagine feeling let down by God himself. I could imagine, um, in a sense, 
maybe taking that part of my life and saying, I just don't even want to think about it. Um, or just being remorseful, overwhelmed by the dreams that didn't materialize. Whatever it is, Moses, instead of communicating the covenant of Abraham, covenant with Abraham through the tradition of circumcision, doesn't have his sons circumcised. And the wife, Zipporah, we're not sure exactly what's going on with her. Again, we can have an interview with her at some point in the age to come. But it seems like, it seems like she's not happy about this whole deal. I would say let, we'll, we'll conclude that. Um, uh, you know, is it possible that she's like, what's, what's the deal here? You know, maybe, you know, maybe she's, she's a little confused. But I think something important is happening here. Let's, let's read the rest of the chapter, and then I'll just share a few thoughts. And the Lord said, verse 27, the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him on the mountain of God and kissed him. So Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses then he did the signs in the sight of the people. So the people believed, and when they had heard, when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked on their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshiped. There's, again, there's a lot of questions about the passage. I do believe it's, there's something here about God Restoring a man who had laid down and stripped of a sense of value, worth, and purpose. I would, I, again, I, I would imagine that by age 80, after 40 years in the land of Midian, that's perhaps where Moses was. And I share that because... I believe that there are people of God who are very overwhelmed, very discouraged, very demoralized. And God wants you to know that he wants to meet you and rebuild you and refresh you in his call on your life. And I believe that's part of what's happening here in, uh, in the book of Exodus chapter 4. It's an unusual passage. Uh, welcome, it's good to see you. Have a seat, join us. Um, I believe that's at least part of what's happening here in Exodus chapter 4. I want you to think about that for a moment. Is it possible that there's something you have done, you've neglected to do, and you feel as a result of it you've, you've missed the call of God? Uh, something you feel like you've done or neglected to do and you feel disqualified in the call of God. By the way, that word today, so refreshing and so fitting. So refreshing and so fitting. Thank you, Renee. That's what's happening here in Moses' life. Moses, I believe, at age 80, we see him as a broken man, and God's restoring him. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. That's something the Lord does. I, I see that in the New Testament. After the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus restores the disciples in particular who's prominent in that restoration, Peter. Peter, the one who, they all, by the way, deserted Jesus. None of them were, you know, front and center. Peter specifically denied him, as Jesus told him he would. And Peter wept bitterly. And what does Jesus do? He restores him in a tender way in a very, very tender way, uh, as in his, in his, in his resurrection uh, you know, encounter with, with Jesus, he gets restored. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. God wants to restore people to kingdom purpose, and he wants to meet you in some of the pain, some of the hurts, some of the disappointments. Maybe it's rejection. I think that you know, when we look through the scriptures, one of the great pains that people face is rejection, misunderstanding. It's very, very deep. 
You know, I remember hearing as a kid, you know, six and stones will break my bones, names will never hurt me. Um, and I was like, yeah, I should shout that louder. But somehow shouting it didn't make it true. There's something about rejection. There's something about that that is very, very demoralizing. That's what Moses faced at age 40 when he stepped forward as the deliverer of the Hebrew people. He was rejected by his own peers, um, uh, his, his own people. Um, and so he's carrying that. God, in some ways, is meeting him very tenderly and taking it away. But I want you to see that although the story is a little um, uh, it's an unusual story. The net outcome of this, the net process that's at least part of the restoration is a step of obedience. That's important. Or it's, God doesn't simply come along and coddle Moses. You know what basically the Lord is saying? Obey me. As an expression of faith, put feet to your faith. You've got faith. How do we know Moses had faith? Well, in verse 18, after his encounter with the Lord, the Lord said to him, I'll be with you. Throw your staff down. Pick it up again, the serpent. Put your hand. After the Lord says all that, gives him, basically says, Aaron will be your spokesman. What does Moses do? He says, I'm heading out. Says to his father-in-law, do I have your blessing to leave? Some faith is kindled. And God's basically saying, as an expression of faith, be obedient. That's important. Because in the current moment, culturally, in the church, there is a disassociation from faith and obedience. The idea that somehow God just sees you in your disobedience, but he loves you anyway, which he does. But that doesn't mean you're not grieving the Holy Spirit. His love is like amazing, yet he's calling us to follow him. He's calling us to follow him in obedience. Jesus said this, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things I say? Lord, Lord, but we ignore him. You know, now you parents know what it's like to have a child say, yes, mommy, yes, daddy, I'll, I'll do it. Yes, absolutely. And then they turn around and they don't do it at all. And you're like, why are you saying yes, you'll do it? And then you don't, you know, well, well, there's, a, there's a gap there. And so there's a, there's a call on us as an expression, as a fruit of faith to be obedient. I believe Therefore, I'm going to leave Midian and head back to Egypt. And the Lord says, good. Now, you're going to be the one who is the lawgiver, Moses. Maybe it would be good for you if you followed my covenant expression. Maybe before you deliver my law to the people, maybe you should be obedient to it yourself. Now, I, again, the story is a little, it's an odd story. We don't have all the details. Some commentators, I mean, they're just, the, the, you know, it's just a little hard, even in some places, to know who's, who's being described. But the general sense is, by the end of it, Moses' son, who hadn't been circumcised, is now circumcised. There's been a step of obedience. Zipporah had to be part of it. Uh, maybe because Moses was so ill, he couldn't participate. Not sure entirely. But basically, God is saying, I want you to walk as a fruit of faith. Our obedience does not earn us God's love. He loves us. Our obedience does not give us a place at his table as children of God. We have that by faith in Christ. But because we have that, we walk in obedience. Because we're the people of God, we follow him. John Piper said this, he said, if your faith in Christ leaves you unchanged, you don't have saving faith. If your faith in Christ leaves you unchanged, you don't have saving faith. Obedience, not perfection, 
but a new direction of thought and affections and behavior. Obedience is the fruit that shows that the faith is alive. James, he's speaking about the epistle, put it this way. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. James 2.17. John Piper continues. Faith alone justifies, but the faith that justifies is never alone. Great statement. Faith alone justifies, but the faith that, the faith that justifies is never alone. It is always accompanied by newness of life. And so steps of obedience are part of what God calls us to in restoration. He's restoring Moses. And that's a beautiful thing. And I wanna I wanna share that because again, I think it's there's a there's a sense in the current culture, Christian culture I'm talking about, greater Christian culture, that somehow God's unconditional love for us leaves us wherever we are, and that there's no call to be sons and daughters who walk in obedience to him. Again, I think Moses was a very broken man. I think he's lacking fortitude. I think he's lacking self-confidence. He's certainly lacking a sense of authority. He's not showing a lot of ambition. Uh, 40 years and he's, you know, just taking care of father-in-law's flocks. Um, uh, you know, he's, he's probably assumed that because of his failure, he's finished with God or that God was finished with him He's downtrodden, but with that background, God calls him to a place of restoration and says, now's the time and is going to use him. But an action outgrowth of that is that the man of God obeys God. Even a broken man can obey God. Even a broken man who has faith in God can respond in faith. Even downtrodden, broken, discouraged. You know, sometimes when I read things, and I'm, I'm talking, again, I'm trying to contextualize this for us today. When I read things, the basic drift of so much that I read is, you know, they had a hard life, difficult life, you know, a lot of things. Just don't expect them to act like Christians, even though they're, they're saved. I'm like, huh? You know, the fact that you had a hard life doesn't give you a license to go around and sin. As a believer, I'm talking. You can't, you can't blame your ongoing sin on the fact that you had a hard life. You can't blame your ongoing immorality, your ongoing slander, your ongoing who knows what on the fact that you had a hard life. Now, I'm, I think I'm very, very compassionate with people. When people come to me and they have a hard life, I, I probably start crying before they do when they're telling me their stories. I mean, it really... I, I really am touched. I mean, I really am. I, I, I'm like amazed. And one of the things I, I realized, maybe it's part of just getting older, the sense of the pain and suffering in the world is like, it's, it's like overwhelming to me at times. I mean, it really is. But that is not intended to be like, oh, so therefore, you can curse out the pastor, you can, <laughs> you can cheat on your husband, you can, that, no, 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 there's, there's a disconnect there. We'll deal with the brokenness and ask for the God of heaven who can restore broken lives to reach in and touch you in the deepest parts in ways that I, I can't even comprehend how much pain you've been through, but he's calling you to steps of obedience. Now, the story here in Exodus 4, it's not neat, it's not pretty, it's, you know, it's, it's not like textbook, Moses rises up, circumcises his son, and it's, it's all good. I mean, it's God's working with the man, but he doesn't simply coddle him and say, but it's okay. The term unconditional love is often being used in the current culture to mean that God doesn't really care for a believer how you live anymore. He loves you unconditionally, so you just keep doing what you want as a believer. That's not true. That's not true. We as believers who have been 
caught by the unconditional love of God, captured by him, renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit, born again, forgiven of our sins, names written in the Lamb's Book of Life, we're called now to live lives pleasing to him, to not grieve the Spirit of God, to really follow him. And so the idea of unconditional love, I think, I think there's, a, there's a way in which it's being presented in the current moment um, that really is, is it, it's, it's, it's inappropriate, it's misleading. In some ways, what we might say here is that although the story is a little bit unusual, maybe a little convoluted, what we have here is a moment where a man encounters God and there's, with his wife's help, there's some repentance. Didn't take care of this before, but we'll take care of it now. Should have, but we'll take care of it now. Thank God for his loving kindness, right? That he gives you space to repent. But that's really what's happening here. Repentance is not just an option in the Christian faith. It's a command of Christ. That's part of how we live. And so the work of the Spirit of God in us, as he restores us, is often accompanied by steps of faith. Oftentimes when I'm, when I'm working with people and they're sharing some of the tremendous pain they're going through, my heart's overwhelmed, but I'm also hearing in the spirit, oftentimes I'm hearing faith action steps. Okay, I, I hear you. Yep, okay, your parents, oh boy, your, your, you know, your teacher in you know, third grade, your, I mean, stuff that people go through is so hard. But I'm also hearing, but here's what God wants you to do. He doesn't want you to remain static. He wants you to step out in action steps. Again, it's an interesting passage. Probably wouldn't have... Uh, I'll, I'll share one other thought. I kind of hinted or alluded to this before, uh, touched on a little bit. Uh, uh, you know, Moses is called to lead. I'll just share this as a sermon in itself, and I won't go into it. Moses is called to lead, and leaders lead by example. You know, uh, it, it probably would not have gone well for Moses to show up <laughs> and say to the Hebrew people, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm God's man for the hour. Uh, I'm going to be used by God to give you the law. Uh, just ignore my sons. Um, it, there's a, a kind of a double standard there that's just unacceptable. So leaders uh, are called to lead. And obedience to God really demonstrates faith. It's an outgrowth of faith. It's an expression of faith. So um, interesting story, kind of story that probably doesn't get preached on unless you're doing a study on an entire book. Um, uh, if you've been following along with the reading, you might have gotten to that section and simply scratched your head for a moment and kept going because um, it it's an unusual passage. I hope in sharing it today, I tried to fill out some of, some of what I think is going on in the passage and what it can mean to us today because I really do think it's, there's an insight here that I'm, I'm not sure if I've seen in too, too many places in the scriptures it's the kind of insight where we see how God takes and works with a broken individual to restore them, at the same time calling them to repentance, calling them to obedience. It's kind of a, I think it's a very significant passage in that regard, especially in a day when those two concepts have almost been separated. There's a truncation of God's restoration and the call to obedience to him. They really, they flow together in a way that really is a very, very beautiful thing. So let me read the three verses we focused on primarily. A lot of it was getting there. Verses 24, 25, and 26, and then I'll pray. 
And it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. Then she said, You are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. Let's pray. Father, I come before you and Lord, I, I know this is a, it's an unusual passage. And uh, Lord, I've tried to uh, not, not superimpose my ideas, but to really understand from the greater context of not only these verses, but the surrounding passage and the story of Moses' life, what, what's going on here. Father, I, I do know that you're a God who restores. And for your sons and daughters, you call us to walk out faith with steps of obedience, even out of our place of brokenness. So Lord, I, I ask you today, Lord, where there is brokenness, where there is tremendous hurt, pain, maybe some here are very demoralized, have given up on things, just there's a hopelessness. Uh, Father, I pray, would you reach in, just as you did with Moses, say to them, I will be with you. I will be with you. I will be with you. The most refreshing words we could ever hear, I will be with you. Most healing, I will be with you most rejuvenating words, I will be with you. I pray, O oh God, that people would hear you saying today, I will be with you. Or maybe it's the pain of some abuse from their past, sexual abuse, other abuse. Maybe it's the pain of rejection from friends, from family. Maybe it's the pain of, of failure. Maybe it's the pain of, of just opportunities that seem to have gone unfulfilled. Who knows what it might be. Lord, I pray today, would you speak? I will be with you. Would you empower? Would you embolden? Would you strengthen today? And Lord, I pray that you'd also reach into those areas of pain. Maybe being raised as a son of Abraham for Moses, he had just tried to forget it. Maybe, maybe even when he had sons, it was a painful reminder of who he was supposed to be. He ignored the call to circumcise his own sons because of his own pain. He just couldn't even face it. But Lord, years later, he revisited that pain in a time of restoration and you called him to take a step of obedience with the aid of his wife circumcision was performed Father I pray that Lord you would supply what's needed for those steps of obedience Lord I pray that we're any of us are stuck. We're stuck in pain. In relationships, stuck in pain. And maybe the expression of our gifts and our ministry. Maybe stuck in areas of pain where we just are constantly filled with thoughts of self-hatred. Thoughts of just devaluing ourselves. Lord, I pray, O oh God, that you would you'd meet us in the deep, deep places and that you would call us out to do your work and prepare us for the very thing you're calling us to. Heal, mend, strengthen, rebuild. 
so that the days to come would be filled with the dynamic of God, just as it was in Moses' life. He goes forward from this, this moment, and he's, he's a dynamic leader. Leadership studies have been made just looking at the tail end of Exodus 4 and Exodus 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and all the way through the story of the life of Moses. He's a tremendous example of a godly leader. Lord, I pray that we would see the dynamic of God in our lives because you've done a work of deep, deep restoration. Father, I ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, um, saints, I hope you're encouraged. I hope, uh, I hope that, that was a difficult passage. Um, and, uh, but I felt, uh, felt in the spirit to, to take a look at it. So you be refreshed, encouraged. Um, Renee invited folks to talk certainly with me and Darlene. There are others in the body. Pray with one another. If there's anything that saints can do, by all means, we are the body of Christ. Let's build one another. God bless you. Enjoy the beautiful fall day.